may be too early to conclude that it is SLS minus, but it's true that both the fact that you have an exponential behavior which tend to, to fully open gaps, and the fact that when you add impurities, you, you, you switch from an exponential behavior to something which gets close to power laws, may mean that at least you can understand it in the framework of, of S plus minus because then you can easily destroy the smallest gap with impurities and, and recover something which is closer to the data you expect for GYC superconductors and for SH superconductors. And again, the authors themselves say they are very cautious and say this is this On the very same system, I have seen also recently some STM data. Uh, and and uh, on this STM data, so this is also to answer a little bit the question of, of uh, Peter yesterday for, for Nayun Tassay and With STM, you can, you can get a, a, a picture of the gap on, on, a, on a full surface. So here it's two nanometers, so you see this is a rather big area of the sample. They scan on the line on, on this surface, and it has a different spectra that you observe on different faces of the family surface. Also of the surface of the sample. So it's quite important to see that too. Because if you do a planar junction, for example, it's never perfect. And it's difficult to see if the result is just coming from a spurious average of the features you want to see, or whether it's something really intuitive. At least with STM, you can see how uh, reproducible are the features that you observe. And in this compound, it's true that you seem to observe two features for the gap and a rather flat and open gap in, in the middle. And the amplitude they observe shift to, to, to the small gap, to the large gap, it's rather homogeneous. Of course, you see the imperfections, but it's not so bad. So again, it's, it's, you cannot conclude something very firm, but it, it, it goes in the direction that this will be, and uh, this is a multi, multi month top on that floor with uh, a fully open gap for the smallest gap. And also, of course, the that. So you can conclude that it's plus, S plus minus or S plus plus, but at least you would see a little gap. So after that, you can, you can argue about this experiment, and I, I cannot say anything to that. But it shows, basically, that uh, uh, there are many progress in this area. So let's now come to heavy Feynman systems. So I believe just last week you got some introduction on, on heavy fermions. And so we just remember you quickly, heavy fermion systems are uh, intermetallic systems, which are really metals with uh, essentially five F electrons or four F electrons, which are coming either from cerium or aluminium ions, and sometimes also from chrysodium or, or other rare earth like italian. And uh, these systems are characterized by the fact that you have very strong correlations. And we call them heavy phenomenon because essentially you measure very large effective masses. Typically, you can measure really with the mixed KG measurement masses which are 240 times the free electron mass, which is a, it's a huge effect. If you look at what is the effect of, of, uh, of correlations, of course, part of this uh, large mass is coming also from bond effects. But the mass renormalization you will get if you make the ratio of the effective mass to the bond mass. Is, uh, it can be at least a factor of 10 or 20, notably in these uranium systems. So it's a system that you have to remember with essentially so intermetallic, so you will have uh, many bands, and, and the physics is governed by this fabric with 4F electrons, which will shift to strong correlations and to large effective mass. So the main physical effect which shift to this uh, large effective mass is condo physics. So we see known for very long. And, and uh, essentially, quantum physics is, is a screening of a local magnetic moment by conduction electrons, which leads to new energy scale, which is typically TK, so it, it's a really many body problem. And uh, if you can look at it from a thermodynamic point of view, essentially, you reduce the, the, the magnetic entropy, let's say R2, if you have a spin one half, on an energy scale, which is TK, which is low. So you get the derivative of the entropy, which is very large, so silver T, or, or if you like the intensity of stage, which is very large, which is typically integrated by TK instead of R2 and by TF for usual method. So you have a specific heat or an effective mass, which is, if you refer to a density of state uh, picture, which is in the ratio between TF and TK. TF tends to be Kelvin, this is 100 Kelvin, you get about 100 enhancement. 
from a magnetic point of view. Essentially, to get this, this uh, strong correlation, what you need is to be basically at the, at the verge of an instability. Because I spoke of quantum physics, which is a local picture. But when you have magnetic moments, these moments in, in the system, they will also interact. So you have also effectual interaction, which should lead to a magnetic order. So in order to get to this system, we need to be just at, at, uh, at the verge of a magnetic instability. And some elements are even uh, magnetic order. But uh, where you are at the limit where TK and, 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 and the, the condo physics and this uh, interaction with actual interaction are, are competing so that the system can just easily switch from one, one state to the other. And, and so we, for a long people, discussed this Dodek diagram when you, you see that depending on the strength, relative strength of TK and TKY, mm -hmm. the condo and actual interaction you, you have uh, it's either a magnetic order state, a heavy balance system, or an intermediate balance system, which is dominating. Now people speak a lot in a picture which is closer to, to uh, that of, of uh, internal magnetism of, of uh, quantum critical points, but basically you have a magnetic order phase and spin fluctuation which will normalize the positive particles, and, and heavy elements are always close to the point where you can. You can completely suppress this magnetic state. So this is why you get shady masses. So it's the same as the Dodek diagram, but with a slightly different language. The important point with that is that we discovered, essentially, we mm -hmm. the community, essentially, in Switzerland and in England, discovered that superconductivity was very often emerging just in the neighborhood of the quantum critical properties. It's when the system, the, the, the magnetic order system is just the supreme, the superconductivity appears. This is the kind of thing which is also looked for in, in two phrases, for example. One of the big debates is to know whether the pseudo gap phase is a really ordered phase and whether the, this dome of superconductivity is coming from a constant critical point to this order phase. In heavy system, systems, this is well established. We know that very often you get superconductivity right at the point where you put the magnetic order disappears. This antiferromagnetic metal, is it this uh, strongly used moment or this big moment? It depends. In, in cellular systems, uh, you can have rather big moments. It's a, a one UV, so it's, you are closer to a, a local moment picture. In uranium systems, it's most often the case that you have a very small moments, and sometimes you don't even find this, this really magnetic phase. For example, in UPT3, that's completely unclear whether you have a magnetic phase or not. In a correlated system, you will see that you have magnetic order, but then the moment is very small. So it's really the difficulty with heavy fermions is that they are really in an intermediate picture between completely itinerant and completely localized. Also, we got a superconducting state, so it was uh, very clear from the very beginning that it was uh, unconventional superconductivity. But contrary to the group rates, you can have very, very different. Uh, Symmetries of the other parameters. Sometimes they can be S-way, most of the time they can be D-way, T-way, I mean, you can have a, a lot of different uh, symmetries for this other parameter. And again, also, as I did not speak of the crystal structure of the systems, but you have all different kinds of crystal structures, they can be cubic, hexagonal, tetragonal, octagonal. So there is no such matrix. Now, the important point for what I want to speak today is the Thermic surface. As I told you, these are intermetallic systems, so you have many bands, and the thermal surface is complicated. So you can measure it very often we, when you can get some sample of Jacqueline in that, for example, with GHP techniques. Sometimes it's are tests at rather high energy. And what you observe is the thermal surface of some cobalt in dome 5. So you have many bands, you have both uh, uh, whole bands, these two are whole bands, these are different uh, sheets. And, and uh, what is important also, this is the F character. So red means you have strong 4F character. Blue means you have no F character. Green is intermediate. What you can see is that some of these bands do have indeed a lot of F character. Some are almost known. And what you recover uh, also is that when you measure the HPA with, with a quantum oscillation, you can measure each of these semi surface looking at the orbits. And you can measure the effective mass on each of these permissions phase. And we find that you have bands of 
very sufficient with very uh, heavy mass, 90 times the equilibrium mass, and some which are weakly correlated with only four times the equilibrium mass. So basically, the, the, the image you can have is the sheets which have strong F character do have these heavy masses, the sheets which have uh, uh, low correlations, not so much F character, of course, they will not be the strong given mm -hmm. So you have both many bands, and the correlations are not on, on, the, on the whole of the family surface. So these are all the ingredients you need, basically, to get multi gap supermolectivity. Because what we know, essentially, is that in this compound, you, you saw with this quantum particle point picture, the fact that superconductivity appears just when the magnetic order disappears means that for it, the primary mechanism is linked with this magnetic order, so it's, it's linked with strong correlation. So what you expect, and what was also uh, really observed from the very beginning, is that these are these heavy quantity particles which try this superconducting state. So you expect to have strong coupling within the F-bands. Moreover, you have large density of states, strong coupling, so you this is a uh, thing that these are these, these F-bands, these heavy quantity particles which will be the dominant uh, band for superconductivity. The other one which are uh, which have less correlation, have a smaller density of states. And probably a weaker family also is linked to strong correlation. You expect that the will be much weaker. So you expect to have uh, uh, coupling constants which are large for, for the, the heavy body particles and much smaller for the other one. Of course, what you don't know is what, what is interbound uh, coupling. Another point I discussed was that the fact that when you have multi gas superconductors, so you have different gaps, this is the definition somehow, but you have also different uh, field scales. And essentially for the each, each band responds with, with, uh, with the field scale, which is typically inversely proportional to its coherence length. And the coherence length is basically the thermal velocity divided by the gap. So in heavy thermal system, it's a peculiar uh, situation where both effects go in the same direction. For heavy bands, you have a small family velocity because they are heavy. You have a large gap, so this coincidence will be rather small, typically of the order of a few nanometers. For the light bands, the DF should be larger, the gap should be smaller, so you will get a much larger wind. <coughs> so you expect to have a very small uh, effective critical field for this uh, weakly correlated band, for this small gap band, and a much larger upper critical field. So let's switch to examples now. The first one in which we really uh, sought to perform multiple superconductivity was chrysodim or some point in the So it was neither cerium nor fibrinium, but the chrysodim ion. Superconductivity of the system was discovered in the group of Nepal back in 2002. It's a superconductor with TC of 1.7 Kelvin. I showed you already, because it's the only system where with STM you could see the gap. And, and uh, it was inferred from this measurement that probably you have distribution of, of gas and probably fully open gas. So, what did we measure but, but with rather poor resolution? So, what did we measure with, with our thermal spectroscopy? And my favorite one is thermal connectivity. So, this is the, the, the real data of the red points here on, on a very good sample. And, and uh, when you subtract the phonon, which are in the green part, what you extract is something which is dropping extremely fast. So this is typically the exponential behavior you expect for a fully mm -hmm. open gap. In blue, you have the PCS behavior. So typically, what you observe also is that even when you subtract these columns, the electronic part remains extremely large, it's orders of magnitude larger than you expect for a PCS gap, also it's exponential. So this is typically the sign that you have a small gap that's fully open, and you can extract from this data typically a value of the, of the gap of the order of <coughs> one Kelvin and of the large gap of the order of uh, a little more than three Kelvin. Again, what you are really sensitive to is this uh, small gap. The large one is basically smeared in, in the part where you have in elastic scattering to your relative sensitivity. So <coughs> this was the first sign that really you have, um, which is uh, in agreement basically with what you observe from STM, that's what is fully open gap here. The other means that are correct. It's a good sign that you have a fully open gap and a very small one. Another sign for multi gap superconductivity 
was the field effect now on the same measurement. So this is the beauty of some connectivity that with the same probe, you can do both uh, thermal spectroscopy and the same sample, you can do magnetic field spectroscopy. So this is especially for Peter, in showing the, the, the low field data. You can see that 50 mK for rather low temperature compared to TC, which is 1.7 Kelvin. This is H2, and this is the thermal connectivity we normalize to thermal connectivity the normal state, sample state equal to the K of so at HC2 or above HC2, it's flat, this is one. And what you see is that at very low fields, you have a huge increase for the thermal connectivity. And essentially, you recover basically 40% of the normal state thermal connectivity in at point 0.1 HC2. At already in extremely low fields, you have a huge increase. And this is the difference between uh, uh, zero peak cool, so you when you run and take the data, and feel cool when you make each time you go above TC and, and you, you make the measurement. You see that somehow when it is uh, feel cool, it's even a faster increase. Okay, like that. Cool. And, and this is also to show you it's not only uh, this value at that uh, temperature, which, which tells you that you are going to get activity. If you look at the data now, it's a temperature at a different thing. So this is again the data at zero Tesla. It shows off uh, very quickly at low temperature. In the field of 20 millitesla, so the HC2 in this compound is around 2 tesla, so it's a hundred of uh, HC2, you recover a constant behavior as you are in the normal state. Okay, so this is really, you know, to write this picture, I told you yesterday that you have, uh, for the small gap band, when it's still super connectivity, essentially it rotates the overlap, and you can consider that this band basically is normal. This is what happens, it's probably this compound, so you have a normal state connectivity due to this bound with a small gap. And after that, it's straightforward. So now you can compare this, this compound, cos D with 2.12, to the other one. So this is again what you expect from a space super connector, no effect at all things. So you put it free, a linear effect. And for MGB2, you have these two curves, where you see this very strong increase in very low field. It's exactly the same in this experiment system. We compare very nicely with this uh, engine. So now the question is, is what is really this effective field? It's, it's, I said it's very small. We have a way to, to quantify it a little bit better. So an important point is, is uh, HC2. I, I wanted to speak of that yesterday. I, I couldn't do it. Oh, I missed some. Uh, yeah, it's better. So. Uh, Daniel already stated me yesterday that uh, you have two mechanisms for the hypercritical field. The paramagnetic limit, it doesn't matter here in uh, in uh, quantum field, basically 10 times, 2 times TC, so it will be for Tesla, in this compound. And the orbital limitation, which goes as inverse of the Korean sense, so it goes like over the S squared. So for heavy positive particles, H2 will be very large. This is uh, what the stuff is trying So now imagine you have a two-band superconductor. I told you when you apply a field which is rather uh, uh, above the effective critical field for the small gap band, it is not superconductivity. Uh, you can ask yourself what happens for HC2, also not at low temperature, but when you are close to TC. Well, what happens, what has been observed, for example, in MGB2, is that you have some curvature. Yeah. And basically, you can say that, uh, in this simplified picture, but you, you could say that when you are at high field, you see only the, the, the bound with the large cap. So you have the usual behavior of H2, which is linear, close to TC, and it has this orbital force. And superconductivity somehow is reinforced at low field because you are capping with this, with this small bound, with this bound with the small bound. So this gives you this upper curvature, and when you destroy the superconductivity of the small bound, then you recover the, the H2 of just a single. So this is a sign of multi gap superconductivity. But the game, it's not an uh, uh, unambiguous uh, probe because you have other effects, a strong capping, which can lead also to this kind of upper curvature. So, this is what was observed on polycrystalline samples for MGB2. And for quite the of some MGB12, you observe also uh, the, the small probe. Uh, the problem is uh, this power plant. Uh, so you, essentially, you have, you have a small deviation of the field. So it, it seems to be very weak, but it was extremely reproducible. So it is from sample to sample, we saw, we saw also the same curvature 
and whether you measure IC2 with resistivity or specificity, it was also always the same. Then you can try to find a, a set of capping constants that can both reproduce this curvature AC2, for example, and the gap to observe on thermal connectivity. Then this helps you to, to define what kind of Fermi velocities you need to put in, in, in the upper critical field. And you find indeed that the, the, this effective critical field is basically 300 times smaller than the real AC2. So it's very close to AC1 in this count. And I, I will skip the, the next example because I want to speak a bit of Fermi discriminators, but we have the same kind of, of uh, behavior in another system, which is Sankova Indium 5. Well, it is more difficult to quantify everything. I just want to show you two things. This other compound, so Sankovat in fact, is the first one from which I show you the, the Fermi surface. At low temperature, again, with thermal connectivity, you measure a huge amount of thermal excitations. Compared to UVT3, which has again this follow the standard mode, we are more than one order of magnitude higher. <coughs> So this is simply really that you have uh, only both a, a, a small gap and also uh, and TYC commander to its well established in this compound you have D uh, X2 minus Y2 superconductivity. <coughs> but probably you have D X2 minus Y2 superconductivity and also with a very small gap. So it's both multi-gap and unconventional. Sorry. So for uh, what are the power laws in this part? Mm -hmm. you know, Power laws are not so clear. So this is uh, here is it's in, in, a, in a logarithmic scale, okay, and here it's a, in a linear scale. This data, mm -hmm. and it's not so clear. So to, to, to extract real power laws, I believe if you don't have uh, uh, this is why I would have really liked that. <laughs> a theorist there has to calculate what should be thermal conductivity in, in a multi-layer system with these two manifolds. Because it, it's not so, you can derive power laws, but say it depends on the range in which you look, and probably it's, uh, it's, it's highly complex. What is sure that the effect is huge. Now, uh, what is exactly the power law? And, and you can separate the both from the view. What, what I would expect is, right, if, I, if you close the gap in one of the in subdominant bands, that yeah. gives you essentially a capital T, which is normal state like. Yeah. Right, and that dominates on presumably higher power laws coming from nodes or whatever else in the other. So shouldn't I expect... This is your field, so you don't, you don't close the gap. Okay. Oh. This is your field, what I show you. This is your okay. field. In zero field already, you have a huge amount... I mean, you separate from electricity down to zero, and, and you have, nevertheless, a, 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 a huge amount of thermal connectivity compared to the number of could go down to 10 millikelvin, so you still see that the quantity is still going down. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very low temperature, but you have a huge amount of thermal connectivity. This is referred to kappa n, so you see from 1, you, 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 you only decrease the factor of 10, basically, to what you would expect. So, yeah. Okay. And on the field, just to show you, but uh, just for you, <laughs> and you need Tesla. So yeah, yeah, remember, H2 is 6 Tesla, so it's almost 1,000 H2. We recover, as you say, normal state. Yeah, okay. So, so the implication, again, is that you get all these quasi-particles simply because you have nodes, but also that the gap for that band is very small. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, I yeah. think you need really mm -hmm. both to have yeah. such a huge amount yeah. of thermal connectivity. So compared to UPT3, you have many nodes. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, you are 10 times below. So it's, it's, it's really a huge effect. Okay. okay. So the last point I want to discuss uh, yeah, the is it, sorry, yeah. is it understood where is it, uh, the extreme influence of vortices in uh, the magnetic field? Sorry, the influence of vortices uh, in, in the magnetic field. Why do you have thermal Ah, you are right. This is rather complicated because you are both, you are restoring some more normal phase, you are uh, inducing Doppler shift of excitations, and you are introducing a new scattering mechanism. Now, nevertheless, when you are at, at, a, at a very low temperature, let's say, and, and the field is also low, then you can understand rather simply what happens. So, this regime is rather simple. After that, if you want to understand this one, it's much more complicated. Okay, let's see your work. This is, uh, but my, my, my idea for theorists is just to calculate at equal zero what should be 
big about age, but this will be already very nice. But you're right, it's, it's, it's complicated. So I just want to say a few words about formality superconductors. Because as you know, up to now, there are, except for this heavy system, there are no really truly coexisting paramagnetic and superconducting states. Uh, and and the, the thing which are closest to that in classical system was the Rashford for one four for example compounds, where you have first a superconducting state and a second batch of formality state. But when it becomes formalistic, you feel superconductivity, and there is only a very small range of temperature. It may have coexistence of both, but then formality <coughs> is determined to a long range of formality state. And on, on the side of the coulomb's length, you see essentially no magnetism. So and this is local moment magnet. This is a local for any uh, yeah. This is local moment in this case. Okay, for the classical system, it's always local moment. So this is important point. You have two different electrons. So this is the local moment. And connection atomics become superconducting. The heavy moment system is completely different because the same electrons are both responsible for the formality state, which is uranium rhodium germanium, which becomes formality at, at around 9 Kelvin, <coughs> cool down to a formality, and below and second 3 Kelvin, you become superconducting. So, and these are the same F electrons, this heavy, uh, which you see to this heavy quasi particle, which are responsible for the formality state and for superconductivity. And then they are truly coexisting. As you have proof with, with LMR and, and, and different proofs that they are really coexisting. And, and uh, in your rosium germanium, so for example, T3 is 10 Kelvin, superconductivity on 0.3 Kelvin, the ordered moment 0.4 mu So it's a rather small moment. It's a very nice system that we, we, we on which we insist. So the first one you discovered is uranium germanium 2. The very next one is uranium cobalt germanium. There's a TC between 0.5 and 0.7 Kelvin, so it's slightly higher than this one. The order moment is 0.47 UV, so it's a very, very small moment. And T theory is around 2.5 Kelvin. So there are three compounds which are rather well studied, so, which are both chromatic and superconducting. And they are also good candidates for, for multi-gas superconductivity because the picture you have for this uh, bond formality, for this formalism, is bond formality, which is a very small order moment. So you expect that the formalism is coming from the polarization of the, of the Fermi surface and so to have different k vectors for the up spin and down spin bars, to make it simple. So essentially, as Daniel explained to you yesterday, if, if this splitting is big enough, it's like for the economic <coughs> capping, if it is big enough in an anthropocymetric system, we will be forced to have a pairing basically on, on each sheet. You cannot pair the electron from one sheet to the other. For me, naively, the idea that, that it, is, it is different, the k vector is bigger than the end of the coherent length. Essentially, this filler mechanism won't work anymore, and you will need to pair separately on each time of the Of course, we start with internal graphing with the spin of it. So, you would expect in this, for this compound to have P wave, let's say, hot parity, and multiband superconductivity. Just uh, very, very quickly. So, to be honest, also today, in fact, we don't know well enough the Fermi surface to know if this condition is complete. What we know is that uh, these systems have very strange magnetic field behavior, so you have very strong phases in all the three systems, and you have very strange uh, behavior also of the, of the upper particle field. For example, for uranium cobalt germanium, so this compound, you see the AC axis is C axis, if you apply the field on the B axis, so it's intermediate strength, you have very strong behavior, with strong curvature already at very low field. But even if you look, and, and I, you can see rush because the poster of Mathieu is still outside, so you can see the data very nicely. Along the C axis, where you have a small upper particle field, you have a very strong curvature of the magnetic field down to 10 mK come to the lowest temperature you could measure. And this is quite unique. It's very uh, close to what you observe also with these non symmetric systems. Except here it's very good. So this, this uh, HC2 measurement, we confirm also with bulk measurements. They have done both with the CPT and connectivity. So it's not just a spurious feature. The same for the reaction behavior. And so uh, this is just to remind you what happened for this uh, what, what Daniel showed you yesterday for these non-temporal symmetric systems, where you have also the same kind of behavior for the upper particle field. 
I love some parentheses. I just want to correct the statement of Daniel. So this lecture was great that he made the wrong statement. One more. Non centrosymmetric systems are not the highest HE system. Ferromagnetic system beats them. Easy, easy. Doctor two at least. And this is HE two divided by TC. There's some squares. You have some pairs. So it's two plus plus are here. So in this compound, you have to use HE two. And to be honest, also, you should divide not by TC by TC squared. If you look at HE two zero, it's more fair. And then it's even worse because you get it's a factor four. So this is really, uh, this is probably really very new physics, only related to multi-gap, but not only in this new, new formatic system. So don't only work on it, also look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Sorry. Okay, so this is the last one. Uh, And then basically with, you know, with two fitting parameters, I typically can describe an elephant. With three, I can make it flap its ears and, uh, and so on. Uh, the alternative is to look at the uh, realistic band structure and try to fit that. And that is possible for some of the simpler compounds. But for example, when I look at uh, fermi surfaces uh, of some of these uranium materials, 
um, I don't know if I try to do this where I should stop. So in a way, when you say multi-band from the experimental perspective, do we mean two, three, four, five? Okay, so from the experimental perspective, what I would say is that what we can detect usually are small gaps. To be honest, with the spectroscopy we have, it's still be authentic to that. So we know there is at least one small gap. And, and uh, I believe already trying to, to, to understand what is going on in this small gap would be interesting. Because in combat in the phase, it's still too okay. So, so you are saying that I should take, a, let's say, a look at the dominant Fermi surface where yeah. there is dominant pairing, and then all the others I can include it as one effective with probably smaller gap, and probably from 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 the perspective of describing experiment, that would be almost okay. Yeah, we are okay right. because we have no no other position. It's a solid okay. quadratic system. We have many other problems, so just forget about that. So you just okay. just try to to fix the main picture. Okay. But this correct. system, what is funny? So two bond. Two bond. I think it's already good enough to, to discard. They are not have those, they are complicated, just but you have huge effects. Yeah. So yeah. just try to, to to understand this huge effect, and the rest you can forget because it's okay. so bad. For this compound, I just want to have a small comment. For this uranium system, they might be not so complicated. What we are pretty sure is that you have rather few carriers in these compounds. For example, in this one, if you look at the specific instruction, it's small. So 100 millijoules, less, less than that. But you have a huge effort difficulty. It means you have a very large effective mass, and probably you have very small pockets, but very heavy. So the Fermi system might be not so complicated. But you are trying now experimentally to try to determine this Fermi surface. But as soon as I look, for example, at thermal conductivity, I would have to start thinking which of the Fermi surfaces, let's say, has a lighter mass, higher Fermi velocity, which of them contributes more to transport relative sure. to specific sure. heat. For and, the, and then, because right? you know everything, so you are, then you will, you will try to fit just one dominant effect, and, and the rest. Well, um, a couple of comments. The, the first one is kind of obvious that, that in general, you're, no one tells you which is the dominant band in the problem. As far as pairing is concerned, that, that can be very subtle. In right. heavy fermions, you usually know because the one with the highest well, F, they have highest F concentration. <laughs> yeah. so, for me, but in general, it's not. Really effects, it, it also, because you can somehow, it's always very difficult to say something on the pairing. Yeah. But looking at this effect of multi gap effects, you can also point out that some Fermi effects are more important than the other. Yeah. But to see curvatures in the upper particle field, it's a very strong effect, but it tells you that if effectively the high, so the band is heavy, high mass, uh, probably the dominant band. But the second comment is that, that uh, you focus primarily on, on um, thermodynamic uh, measurements, which uh, are obviously very important and probably the most reliable at the present time. But in principle, what one would like to have is a spectroscopic tool which is able to uh, probe uh, individual Fermi surface sheets and tell you what the, uh, uh, the structure of the gap is there. And uh, we actually looked at this recently in terms of the uh, effect of, uh, of superconductivity on certain phonon line, uh, line widths. Because if you have a phonon with a particular Q vector, um, and it can connect Fermi surfaces at different distances, and in principle, you can pick out uh, which Fermi surfaces you're probing. And it's a complementary probe to, to neutrons, which which do some something of the same. But I'm just saying, as a general problem for people to think about, it's uh, yeah, I think it's very important, and where we should be heading with studying multi-gap systems. Yeah, it's a difficult thing, just indeed, because this is very low in compounds. Mm. So usually, so in the Raman scattering. Uh, our place you can forget to to for the sure. yeah. activity it's called the focus. Yeah. So you have your own that. So I know that also the people in the they are really looking also now at this uh, this question of lifetime of phonons, some compounds. Maybe there's a way to get something out. Also it will be also very direct because of course phonons are not probably the dominant mechanism of phone. No but that's not even important. It doesn't yeah, have yeah, to be this yeah. is why it's, it's, it's probably a way Yeah, um, this may not be a fair question either, but <laughs> let me <No>. ask anyway. <laughs> the, most of heavy fermions so far we've been seeing and heard are, you know, have some antiferro magnet nearby. Yeah. So are these, why these are so exceptional? You know, since they have, have you know, any antiferro magnetic signal is absent and while well, this appears below the 
ferromagnetic transition. But in principle, it's true that uh, in nature you have much more anti-phormagneticism than phormagnetic. So in most heavy fermions, it's, there are not so many heavy fermion systems which, which are which are phormagnetic. Right, okay. exactly. And so this one are peculiar structures. They are all orthorhombic uh -huh. with some kind of zigzag chain for uranium and a peculiar distance of uranium which helps to, to, to get this uh, phormagnetic uh, uh, order. But it's true that, for example, I think uranium cobalt germanium, if you apply the field along the C axis in high enough field, you will store some kind of anti phormagnetic correlation. Mm -hmm. That is, you will have an anti phormagnetic capping between, you will use one of the cobalt salts, which is anti phormagnetic capping. <coughs> So they are not always rather also close to, to, to anti-formatic correlation. <coughs> but you know, for example, you take uh, solid helium-3. I think at high temperature, you measure uh, formatic correlations, and it orders anti so yeah, both yeah, of them yeah, are usually yeah, always competing. So it's, it's, uh, right. it's, it's true also in this compound. There's no... So can we conclude that the anti-ferromagnetic fluctuation is not universally given us the superconductivity in heavy fermions? Seems yeah. Yeah. You know, people are also uh, looking at mechanisms like balance fluctuations to induce superconductivity, so anti fluctuations, chromatic fluctuations, any kind. Uh, if you take systems like the uh, Kappa 2 silicon 2, so the first heavy fermion superconductor was discovered by Stevich in 1979, mm -hmm. under pressure, you have a very anomalous curve with a TC which is increasing. So you, you see, I think you have two bumps, and people think that the first bump is probably due to anti chromatic correlations. The second bump of, of TC would be, it's the same for silicon palladium to silicon 2, valence situation in new superconductivity. This is one model which is, which is rather reasonable. So you, you have different mechanisms. But it's always some, more, some kind of magnetic instability. Is there a pressure study done on this material? Yeah, sure. On uranium cobalt, there are, so uranium germanium 2, it's, it's a four magnet at, uh, at uh, ambient pressure. Okay, and when you cool down, uh, basically, it, it, it's, um, it gets superconducting only under pressure. So, uh, in a pressure range uh, around 10, 10 kilobars. And uh, for a small pocket of superconductivity. Uh, this one, essentially, so it, it's uh, terminating and superconducting at ambient pressure. When you apply the pressure, uh, superconductivity is decreasing and the chromatism is increasing. This degree is, uh, is getting higher. In this one, you, you get the usual picture. We have a dome of superconductivity centered on the place where, where basically T theory is going on. So yes, they are very, there is a very important to understand the phase diagram of the pressure. But there was no anti-ferromagnet on the no, pressure. No, no, so no, I'm no, just no, trying no. to see other Maybe base, we need to drive to high uh, base no, parameters no. where you no, can no. probably see the I think it's they, are, they are really the, the good structure of to induce this one. It's, it's, it's different from the other ones. Thank you. I have a question. Somehow, what, what, what confirms is more or less this two x one the fact that you have HC2, you see, which is the of almost 20 Tesla here, whereas TC is only 0.6, so you are completely above. Yeah, you can only explain it. So, yeah. except if you have a, a, a very strong. Uh, it's not completely obvious because. It, also, if, if you have really two parameter phase which are strongly polarized, with different. Uh, the, the problem is that the, the, the external field plays a little, little role somehow compared to the internal field. And so it's not completely obvious that this is a proof that, that it's only. Because the difficulty is that along the C axis where you have this magnetization, then you are within the poly limitation. So you don't see poly limitation since you don't see any curvature of each mm -hmm. loop. But you are below this point. So this is the place where you would have liked to, to see that uh, AC2 is higher. Mm -hmm. And for this direction, which are not along the main uh, high axis for the, for the, for the, for the, the magnetization, then you are well above, but it's true that you may find alternative information. It's most likely that it is P wave, but it is not directly good. It is very, always very difficult. And we need to improve also the terms. We are really improving a lot in this one. So I think soon we will get much clearer. So thank you very much for the